Dr. Albert Van Dyken in this second video on LiDAR systems. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, ways that you can collect LiDAR data and uh, what the, uh, the, the principles and the advantages and, and disadvantages are of those different uh, systems. So I think the, the first thing uh, to uh, reiterate is that previously we've been mostly talking uh, about airborne LiDAR data collection, uh, but there are other ways of uh, collecting LiDAR data. You don't necessarily have to collect this for, uh, from an airplane. You, you, it's essentially a form of laser scanning, uh, and uh, you can do that uh, from a satellite. In fact, of course, your footprint will be much higher in that case, uh, and uh, as, as uh, expressed in the lower resolution of the data. Um, and you can also do it in a local plot uh, with something that you, you uh, set up on a tripod, as we'll see, or hold in your hand. And of course, you can have very high resolution laser scanning of your environment in that case. So first a few satellites. So the, the, um, the first uses of satellite laser uh, altimetry, uh, as we might call it, uh, was to look at ice sheets and uh, glaciers and the like. So when I say altimetry, it's basically the, the measurement of, of, uh, of elevation uh, of the uh, surface. And so again, here's the, the, the same principle we saw before. We've got a simple waveform. Um, not much coming back here, a bit of noise, maybe hitting aerosols in the atmosphere or something like that. Uh, and then a suddenly uh, a steep peak uh, from the, uh, the, the ground surface, or in this case, the top of the ice, uh, most likely. Um, it, a more complex waveform here could be uh, because you've got some uh, topography even within the footprint of your, uh, of your beam. So you, know, you might have a bit of a rock outcrop, for instance, uh, and maybe a crack in the ice. Uh, so you get a few peaks here. So this gives you some sort of sense of the um, the interpretation that is often required to turn these peaks into in, you know um, in, into meaning. What what are these peaks? What objects do they represent? Um, this is just to say uh, that there is a, a repeat mission uh, a plan for 2017, uh, which has a slightly different geometry. So uh, the first uh, satellite. I set satellite measured only straight zenith underneath the satellite. Uh, uh, the one that is going to be uh, launched in 2017, not 2016 here. That's a typical thing with satellite missions. They tend to sort of be delayed a bit. Uh, and so we can't be sure that it will be launched in 2017 either, but that's what we assume at this point. Um, and as you can see, that, that sends out um, beams in different directions. So we, it is able to scan more uh, within one overpass, essentially. That's the fundamental idea there. Uh, and then, of course, here's an example of an airplane where, where you can have an almost full array of measurements. And that, that second mission, uh, one of the things uh, that I said too will look more uh, at is uh, vegetation canopy height because the first I said mission turned out to be very useful in that respect. Uh, now, going a bit further again, there's a, a sort of called Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation or JEDI mission planned for 2018, and that's actually going to try and collect full waveform LiDAR uh, and store it as full waveform LiDAR. So one of the things to remember, as you can imagine, is that uh, that, that curve that represented the whole uh, waveform with all its different peaks um, is, 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 is uh, in itself maybe not a lot of data, but if you do that for every scan, then you end up with a very large amount of data. And so that's why, as part of the instrument post-processing, often immediately that gets turned into the first returns, the grant returns, and the peaks in the waveform, and then the rest of it is thrown away. Uh, now you do lose a lot of valuable information, particularly on the vegetation doing that, and so this JEDI mission intends to collect all these um, full waveforms <coughs> and uh, hopefully look more at canopy structure and what that means for biomass of, uh, of, uh, of our um, forest and so forth. All right, I'll do some uh, ground-based um, LiDAR methods then. Here's an, uh, an instrument that's uh, developed at CSIRO uh, probably about eight years ago or ten years ago, um, called the Echidna. Uh, and uh, essentially what it is is a laser scanner that um, uh, it, uh, it uh, swivels around on its uh, pen tilt unit and it basically scans the whole environment. And so this is distorted because you have to imagine this as a, as a, as a hemisphere. Um, but it basically tells you exactly where all the trees and leaves and whatnot uh, are. and. Um, that's of course pretty useful if you're uh, trying to work out, uh, for instance, what is the uh, number of trees or what is the total um, uh, amount of, um, of uh, wood or, or carbon stored in this particular forest. But you can imagine the enormous amount of data that you get from this. 
Um, here's another example of a similar instrument, but in this case, uh, a handheld one that you can walk around with, which means that you can cover a larger area. So this thing is called the Zebedee, also developed by Cesaro more recently. Uh, and it was originally developed um, for applications where you don't have a GPS uh, signal. So you can imagine, you know, if if, um, if I wanted to know where I was in the landscape, I would typically probably use a GPS, like your phone has one, uh, and, and and use that as a reference uh, for my laser scanning. Well, the Zebedee was designed for using buildings and caves and the like, uh, and so couldn't couldn't have that sort of uh, GPS referencing. And so what it does is it compares all the data points that it collects uh, and it constructs a three-dimensional model of the environment uh, on its own accord. So uh, a very complicated piece of engineering and data processing, but it works uh, quite impressively. Again, here for a little piece of forest in Black Mountain. And what you see in red is um, the nearest trees and in blue the furthest trees. And again, a lot of data in that it can use for um, uh, wood volume or carbon estimation or uh, characterizing the, um, the strata in the vegetation. All right, so we talked about some lighter application, vegetation structure, we talked about it. Hydrology, we didn't really talk about that, but you can imagine that particularly knowing the, um, the surface uh, uh, topography can be very important for things like uh, uh, flood prediction or erosion mapping, that sort of stuff. Uh, ice measurements, very important to know whether, uh, whether you're gaining or losing uh, ice, for instance, or how fast it's moving if you do repeat measurements. Uh, Archaeology, we're going to see an example of that. Land altimetry, so a typical sort of surveying uh, data collection is often now done with LIDAR rather than with uh, the old-fashioned sort of survey uh, instruments. Uh, city planning uh, uh, and uh, caves, as we're going to see a few examples. So uh, again, here's an example uh, of uh, some, some archaeological applications, I suppose, where uh, first the uh, LIDAR was collected to know where the actual object was in this case that needed to be uh, freed from the, uh, the, the, the canopy. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, some some uh, trimming could be done, I suppose, to uh, uh, free this object. Uh, here's an example for city planning. So it's a very quick way to get a sense of where the buildings are in the city. Uh, in this case, presumably Manhattan by the looks of it. Uh, and uh, as I said, the Zebedee in particular is a, a system that doesn't require a GPS and, and uh, has been used successfully to map out entire caves. Little example of uh, of archaeology here. So this is an example in New Zealand at the left there, uh, where you see a, a aerial photo of the uh, canopy. And if you remove the canopy, you strip it back uh, by only looking at the ground returns. Uh, then uh, you can see some really interesting archaeological features. So you can uh, see some uh, some uh, mounds, some some buns, I suppose, filled buns where maybe roads or walls used to be, and uh, without uh, logging the entire forest. So great applications for archaeology. Uh, a similar example at the right, you can see the forest canopy and if you strip it back uh, you can see some uh, terracing of the hillsides uh, that was done in, uh, in uh, Mayan times uh, and you can see some structures here as well, some, some houses or such. So very useful for archaeology. Um, so the question then arises, we've, we've seen satellite with uh, LIDAR, we've seen uh, airborne LIDAR, we've seen ground-based LIDAR, well, what can we use that for and when? how do, should we choose between those? Well, often it's a matter of scale uh, and of course that reflects your research aim. So if you want to know for, uh, let's say, um, uh, the ACT or Black Mountain in reasonable detail how much fuel there is, this, uh, uh, in one of our projects looks at that, then you typically use airborne LIDAR because your area is too large to survey by hand and too uh, the resolution of satellite uh, data would be too coarse to be particularly useful for that. So as you'll see, it's, it's typically a spatial scale kind of kind of question. But at the same time, of course, budget uh, can be an issue. So uh, airborne campaigns tend to be a, a, a lot more expensive than uh, even buying one of these handheld instruments, for instance. Uh, whereas the satellite data is typically freely available. Um, and then, of course, uh, the uh, the time frame within which you need it uh, is uh, important. So there's already a lot of LiDAR data uh, that has been collected in the past, and if it suits your need, then you can use it almost instantly uh, rather than having to um, commission collecting your own LiDAR. So there's some considerations about LiDAR uh, and explanation of uh, the principles of it, and um, uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, this video.